I'm going to go ahead and get started um, on the Jump into STEM webinar for, for the competition, Pushing the Envelope with Wall Retrofit Designs. Uh, I will be introducing Jump into STEM and also introducing our presenter, Andre Desjardins from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is the last webinar in the Jump into STEM webinar series, so we, in hope, you, we hope that you enjoy the content. Jump into STEM is sponsored by the US DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy's Building Technology Office, with support from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, or ORNL, and the National Renewable <laughs> Energy Laboratory, NREL. Our vision with Jump into STEM is to inspire the next generation of building scientists by focusing on supportive, supporting creative ideation and diversity in the building science field. The Jump into STEM program provides a gateway or an on-ramp for undergraduate and graduate students to experience the research and career possibilities of studying building science. Our intent is to attract students from diverse majors and diverse backgrounds. Jump into STEM is managed by Mary Hubbard from the USDOE, Dr. Kim Trenbath from NREL, and Jahi Simbai from NREL, Melissa Lapsa from ORNL, and Dr. Yanjin Bei from ORNL. Jump into STEM challenges are open to any student enrolled in a U.S. college or university. We have a professor team from Georgia Tech, Hampton University, the University of Tennessee, Colorado School of Mines, Southern University, Clark Atlanta University, the University of Alabama, NC A&T State University, and Tennessee State University. These professors promote Jump into STEM at their school, and many, and many of them offer it in their classrooms for a grade. We also want to introduce our advisory panel with representatives from ORNL, NREL, NSF, the Oak Ridge Associated Universities, or ORAU. They provide guidance to us on, outre on outreach and to the program as a whole. With Jump into STEM, our goals emphasize cultivating diversity of thought by underscoring the importance of interdisciplinary teams inclusive of women and minorities. Jump into STEM works with university and college professors from a variety of disciplines to support creative building science challenges that, that can be integrated into coursework curricula. Jump into STEM's network includes leveraging public-private partnerships with industry partners and STEM organizations to support annual student challenges and events. On this slide, you can see a quick snapshot on how the Jump into STEM student competition works. Eligible students can compete for up to four paid internships at either ORNL or NREL. Please go to jump.ideascale.com and navigate to the home page by clicking um, on the link that says Return to the Jump into STEM website, which is run by ORNL. On this web page, you can view eligibility requirements and the full schedule. From this web page, you can click on how it works at the top of the home page to view a step-by-step -step process on eligibility, building a team, ideation, and idea submission requirements. Also on the top navigation bar is the schedule for the Jump into STEM 2019 to 2020 competition. Eligible students can participate in any of the three concurrent online challenges running now through November 15th. These challenges are supported by an online webinar series, which is this series, designed to provide insights on industry practices, market issues, and other supporting resources to help students build and generate their idea solutions. After the three challenges close on November 15th, the Jump into STEM will run a judging process to select finalists to compete on January 31st. Sorry, let me say that date again. There'll be finalists that compete on January 31st 2020, and this will be competing in a final Jump into STEM competition that will be hosted by either NREL in Golden, Colorado, or ORNL in Oak Ridge, D.C. During this final event competition, judges will award the 2020 Jump into STEM internship winners. Again, please go to jump.ideascale.com for details on how it works, eligibility requirements, and schedule updates. From this website, you'll have to Again, 
click the link that says Return to the Jump into STEM website to get these details. I want to, again, quickly go over the Jump into STEM challenge topics. There are three of them. The first is focused on smart sensors and controls for residential buildings. Competitors interested in this challenge should develop a unique application that uses sensor data in residential buildings for the purpose of reducing energy, maintaining or improving occupant comfort, and or to improve, to provide better responsiveness responsiveness to the electric grid. Strong ideals, ideas will present a proposed approach, identify the sensor data and how the data will be used. The idea should also discuss the anticipated impact in a tech-to-market plan for the application. The second jump into STEM challenge topic is designing a healthier and energy efficient air distribution system for small commercial buildings using your local climate zone. Strong ideas will identify a novel system for the selected climate zone and will present an implementation of the solution in a hypothetical or existing building. Solutions should, should articulate the expected impact from the design system and also include a technical market plan. The third Jump into STEM challenge is focused on pushing the envelope with innovative wall retrofit designs. Students are challenged to design a residential wall retrofit project or system that can address replacement or supplement of um, address the replacement or supplementation of current leaky and unhealthy walls. Strong ideas will identify how the wall retrofit will work and will be inclusive of details on how to address the issues of moisture and air tightness. Additionally, the idea ideal solution should address one or more of the following issues low indoor air quality, high energy costs, or high retrofit costs. Like the other Jump into STEM challenge topics, the idea solution should include a tech-to-market plan. The final event from last year's competition was held at NREL. At this time, the, end, the finalists were able to pitch their ideas in person and network with other students, professors, and industry stakeholders. Here's a few pictures from that event. I also want to give an introduction to the students that won last year. We had three internship winners. Um, we had two intern interns that worked at NREL for the summer, and we had one intern that worked at ORNL. One of the interns that worked at NREL was Cade Lawson. He worked on an analysis software called Comstock that allows users to model the entire commercial building stock of the United States. Sarah Tinsley was, was an intern at Oak Ridge National Lab, and she worked on a project titled Building Energy Modeling for Oak Ridge Buildings. And Carl Woodard was an intern at NREL and his work focused on thermal energy storage through the use of phase change materials. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for the webinar technical topic of today. The speaker is Andre Desjardins. Andre Desjardins is the program manager for the Building Envelope Systems Research Program at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He has been involved in building envelope and materials research for over 50 years, first as a consultant and for the last 25 years at ORNL. His areas of expertise include building envelope and material energy efficiency, moisture control, and durability. Now I'd like to turn the webinar over to Andre. Thank you, Kim. Uh, the, uh, the presentation that I'll be making this afternoon is uh, on the envelope challenge and pushing the envelope on it with wall retrofit designs. And what I'm going to do is start off by describing a research program that has been ongoing at Oak Ridge National Lab for the past two and a half years or so, looking at a cost effective easy way of retrofitting walls, uh, existing wall systems. I'll, I'll bring you up to date with the, uh, on the research project and then kind of 
give you a jumping point for where uh, you may want to consider proposing uh, continuing uh, along along this path using the information that we've gathered thus far, but helping us to effectively overcome some of the shortcomings of the system that we've been working on and developing. So uh, that's the kind of the gist of the presentation. So I think everybody is going would agree that if you're involved in making a building envelope more energy efficient, the most difficult part of, of doing that is, is to improve the energy efficiency of the wall systems. So that was the focus of our project. Can we come up with a cost-effective way of giving homeowners a system and a means of updating the energy efficiency of their wall systems while improving the aesthetics of the of the building envelope during during a retrofit. The, we came up with a product idea, and I'll share that with you. And the idea of this product would be not only would it uh, improve the aesthetics, but also meet uh, the energy requirements of the most recent uh, building codes. Uh, so it could also be used in new construction as well as retrofit construction, and, and therefore uh, have, you know, applications in, in both market segments. So here's a, kind of a couple of pictures of how do you retrofit a wall, a residential wall system today. Uh, the first two pictures, the, the left and the center, are, are means of accessing the, the uninsulated cavities of, of walls. You can either access them from the outside uh, or the inside. You have to penetrate the wall, either the exterior sheathing or the interior gypsum board, in numerous locations in each wall cavity. Inject into the into the walls either a loose fibrous insulation or a foam insulation, and hope that there aren't any blockages. It's hard to you're effectively insulating without seeing what you're doing, and uh, you, you can do an infrared scan after the fact to see how how well you've uh, completely filled the cavities. As you can tell, there's a lot of work involved. You're co certainly compromising the interior gypsum board. No no matter how well you prepare these these holes, you'll, you'll still see them if you're the homeowner, you know where they are. The outside, you've got so many penetrations. Typically, this is done if you're going to uh, reside over the existing siding. Just very occasionally is the, the technique used uh, that's shown in this picture where you're actually removing portions of the existing cladding and penetrating these. So both of those are obviously incredibly labor intensive. The third option probably isn't any easier, which is shown on the picture on the right. Here you're basically building a new wall on the exterior of your existing wall. So your house had a brick facade, adding several inches of continuous insulation, uh, basically true polystyrene insulation. You have to move all the windows uh, because uh, all the windows will no longer be aligned with the cladding. Uh, again, this, this procedure is typically used when you retrofit. You're replacing all the all the fenestration products and all the doors. Like, still have to rework the details around the roof socket. Uh, and you can see that this is an incredibly expensive process. Uh, you're going to get effectively a, a brand new house out of this, and you're probably going to pay about the equivalent of, of that. Still stuck. Okay, so. Uh, the technique that we're working on is, is based on using a very high performance insulation material, which is called a vacuum insulation panel. And we've got a, kind of a photo of uh, a typical vacuum panel on the left hand side. The vacuum panel is, is basically uses a core of, of, of material, and the core of material is it's inserted into a bag. The, the bag is then a bag. Uh, well, evacuated, excuse me, and then sealed so that the inside of the bag is at a fairly low pressure, typically about five millibar. The core materials can be a number of things. Uh, the bones have been used, fibrous materials have been used, but what's traditionally used is the nanoporous material. Uh, 
in silica or precipitated silica is, is a very typical hill for these materials. And the exterior bags are typically multi-foil uh, uh, materials that are uh, both water vapor impermeable and air impermeable. Obviously, the key to maintain the R values here is to maintain the vacuum. And you can see on the graph on the right, the R value of these vacuum insulation panels or uh, a variant we, which we've been working on is called Modified Atmosphere Insulation, or MAI. Uh, it has an R value that is five to six times that of traditional insulations that are used in the marketplace. So in a very thin section of insulation, you can get a very large, a very high R value. So there are insulated sidings that are on the market today. There's a picture of one in the center top there. Basically, what's being used in the marketplace today is a fairly thin layer of graded polystyrene foam. This product offers an R value of about R2. Uh, what we were looking for is to try to develop a insulation material that would fit in a similar manner uh, nested into a vinyl siding uh, profile, having the same thickness as the foam, but having an R value of at least R10. The reason that we were shooting for an R10 is that all the new building codes uh, require some level of continuous insulation. If you have an R value of 10 with your cladding, you're satisfying the continuous insulation requirements anywhere in the continental 48 US. So, the addition of just the cladding itself with this MAI insulation adhered to the back of it would, would allow you to have uh, an R value fed meeting the requirements of the building code. That plus filling the cavities are all that would be required to meet the code. So what, what kind of impact would this have if we were able to develop this product? Well, the walls represent about 1.6 quads of energy uh, and uh, if you look at the technical potential of how much energy is used in all of residential buildings in the U.S., to kind of put this in perspective, the entire U.S. economy uses 100 quads of energy. So this represents 1.6% or fairly a huge amount of energy that could be saved if this product could be developed and, 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 and penetrate the market. We, we chose to try to work with vinyl siding as our cladding uh, alternative. The reason that we chose that is according to the U.S. Census data, it has the largest market share of, of any uh, cladding material, primarily, especially in the retrofit market. Uh, 1.1 million homes are recited every year. And one of the additional benefits of vinyl siding is that the National Association of Realtors estimates that if you, if you uh, invest say $10,000 in a residing with vinyl siding, you will recover about 83% of that due to an increase in the value of the home. So the actual cost is only 17% of the investment uh, that's made in the siding. So Nachi panels have been around since the 1970s. They've, uh, are used in quite a few different applications, but never penetrated the building market, primarily because of their cost and the uh, fact that they are made in, in, in fixed shapes and sizes. The uh, first issue was, can we make a vacuum panel that, or an MAI panel that would match that of a vinyl, uh, shape of a vinyl, uh, vinyl siding? And you can see in the bottom left picture, we built a press, we were able to press the fume silica into a shape uh, representing the, uh, the profile of the vinyl siding, that picture shown in the center top. We then would insert it into our multi-layer barrier materials and evacuate it and seal the bag, that picture is the middle, uh, bottom middle. And then we would adhere these to the back of vinyl, vinyl siding. And uh, the picture on the right is you can see we're building a test wall in the laboratory to uh, see what is the thermal performance of, of the system if we add it to a, a residential wall. 
So we, we have a, a large scale testing facility which is called a guarded hub box. And this allows us to measure very large cross sections of uh, walls or roofs or foundation systems. The specific one that we have here is looking at a wall system that was roughly eight feet by eight feet in cross section and was made up of eight, eight pieces of vinyl siding. Uh, each one of the vinyl siding uh, sections was uh, eight feet long, and we had four of these vacuum panels, or MAI panels, adhered to the back of these. The, the idea of making small size vacuum panels is that obviously, if you had somebody puncture this vacuum panel, you will lose its R value. And by making multiple small vacuum panels, we would limit the damage to only a small percentage of the area. So we, we did a test. Our goal was to try to get an R10 out of this, and we were actually measuring an R value of about 13, just on the shy side of R13. And the photo on the right-hand side is a thermographic image of the wall system. What you can see is the, the, the blues and the greens are showing the, the thermal leaks through the wall. The, uh, the, that's where the bailing flanges of the vinyl siding is, and there's no insulation at that location. You can see some vertical lines, so those are the mating joints between the different vacuum panels. If they're butted together, you get a little bit of a heat loss through the through that joint, but it's, it, it's really not, not too bad. The big heat leak here is, is through the, the nailing flange. And of course, since we can't penetrate the, vinyl, the, the vacuum panel, you have to have the nailing flange uninsulated. And that takes uh, the, the MAI panel from an R value of roughly 40 for one inch thickness down to this R13. It's all due to the thermal bridging of the nailing flange. So we we thought we had a we, we thought we had a winner. We had a, a product. Uh, we've been working on the cost of vacuum panels and developing these MAI panels are much cheaper than traditional vacuum panels. We've cut the price of vacuum panels by 50 to 60 percent. Uh, we were able to put them, uh, make them in shapes that would fit with vinyl siding. We were able to make the, the materials together, did some durability tests to show that they uh, would, would stay adhered together even under some fairly harsh environments. Uh, so we said, okay, let's take our, our, our technology out to the marketplace and let's see what the industry actually thinks of, of this product. So we, we set up four different uh, workshops, one in Columbus, one in Albany, one in the Baltimore area, and then one uh, out in Islip, New York. And these were all held in the last couple of months. And what we did is we had our industry partners uh, invite their sales staff, people that they sell to, contractors, people who would be involved on a regular basis with installing vinyl siding. For examples of the, of the material, we Told them you know, uh, a little bit of what, what we had, what you know, what we perceive the benefits to be, and then basically ask them for their feedback. What, you know, what do you think uh, about about this new technology? So our, our goal was to be innovative, and our definition of innovative is better, faster, and cheaper. If we could meet these three requirements, we would certainly have a winner. So we we thought going in that. Uh, we were better. We, we, we knew that if you put insulation behind vinyl siding, it holds the vinyl siding more taut. And certainly from an aesthetics perspective, everybody who has looked at vinyl siding with and without insulation in the back thinks that the insulated one is much prettier. It's much more, uh, uh, it doesn't flutter as much, it's flatter, it holds its shape better. So we thought you know, putting a uh, vacuum panel would give us the same impact as the uh, traditionally insulated vinyl siding. That was that was a good thing. We also knew that we had a lot more R value, uh, and we could offset some of the additional costs by saying that well now you don't have to add continuous insulation in construction, or in a retrofit construction you're going to have a lot of additional energy savings. We actually did some calculations, showed them what the the, the energy savings back be if they added this sort of technology to an uninsulated or a poorly insulated uh, structure. Uh, we thought that putting the insulation and the vinyl siding together would be faster. 
now you only have one craft that's needed to come in and uh, install this product. You don't have to have installation installed first and then have the cladding people come in later and do installation. So we thought that combining or developing a, a, a system that it was multifunctional, had multi -pur multiple purposes, would address the issue of faster. Cheaper, well, we were cheaper from a first cost perspective because obviously uh, these vacuum panels are going to be more expensive uh, on a per R basis than traditional insulation. But if you wanted to get these high R values uh, for a building and save energy, you have to put significant thickness of these traditional insulations and then you run into a lot of uh, extra costs associated with either moving the, the fenestration, reworking the soffit, reworking the ground the ground line, uh, adding you know, transitions between those those products. So we thought that on a, on a system level basis, uh, we, we, we could be cheaper. So that was our these were our goals, and this was kind of our inclination walking into these. So we had these meetings, uh, like I said, we had four of them, and the feedback that we got was, was somewhat surprising. Uh, well, maybe, to, maybe to me it was surprising, but maybe not to a number of you. The very first thing that, that's obvious, and we knew this going in, is cutting, cutting this product is, 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 a, is, is an issue. Uh, the, when you cut the product, uh, the, the fill material, the, the fume silica, it almost acts like uh, like wet sand. It's not like it's going to come pouring out of this container, but uh, what will happen is that if you do not seal it, you're going to lose that material eventually. And it's obviously going to spill over the siding and, and make a mess. So issues concerning how are you going to cut this? And one of the things that we learned, and I guess kind of thought this was an issue, but didn't appreciate the magnitude of the issue, is that when you are siding a home with vinyl siding, uh, if you're using uninsulated vinyl siding, the guys can just use tin snips and they cut through the vinyl and this, the task is done in five seconds. If you have insulated siding, it's a little bit more work, but with this product itself, it, it becomes a lot more work. Uh, you have to seal uh, the the, the barrier to prevent the material from falling out, and the number of times you have to cut were, were pretty significant. Another issue that came up that uh, I guess was somewhat surprising to us is that the material is silica, and silica is uh, considered a potential carcinogen. The siding industry has been wrestling with this for years and years, Fiber cement siding, which is the second favorite uh, siding material that's used, is filled with silica. Kitchen cabinets are filled with silica. Toothpaste is filled with silica. Silica is everywhere. But several of the contractors felt that uh, their workers would not like to work with uh, uh, a material where when you cut it, uh, especially if you use a power tool, you're going to get a mist of silica and that's going to cause a problem. And then finally, the, you know, one of the issues that was brought up is uh, labor is a major issue in the cladding industry. Whenever you go to an insulated siding product, that means that you have more labor. The quality of labor today is poor. Several of the vinyl siding uh, contractors were telling us that they have more work than they all. If you go to this, this sort of technology, you're going to increase the labor effort, and that is, is a problem because of the lack of qualified labor. So those were the, the main issues that were brought up uh, during the course of our uh, four uh, workshops. So we asked the, the, the workshop attendees to give us a score. Would you, would you use this product? Would you sell it? Would you install it? And we asked them to you know, score this from uh, one, absolutely no, uh, ten, absolutely yes, to five, maybe. See our scores. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the scores are in that reverse chronological order of the, uh, of the workshops. You think we would get better presenting this, but apparently we get worse presenting this as the scores went down as we started in Columbus and ended in Long Island. Uh, 
But obviously, uh, there, there are some issues to be associated. Uh, and I kind of went over those. Uh, cutting is the, the, the real bugaboo. Uh, is there a way of modifying the system to completely eliminate or significantly reduce the number of times that you would need to cut the, the vacuum panels? Uh, is there a way of handling the silica? Is there a specialized tool that could be used to, to, to cut these products? You install the, the vacuum panels first and then install the siding afterwards. Several people suggested splitting, you know, we, we thought that creating a multifunctional product was the right way of going, but, but several people said, no, we're stupid. You should be looking at them separately. And so that was, yeah, that was kind of eye-opening. Uh, so I've got a couple more slides here, and I'm really kind of not going to go into the detail, but I, I think the slides are going to be available to you. And here's kind of a much more detailed uh, listing of what feedback we got from the different, uh, the, the four different uh, 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 workshops that we performed. So the uh, challenge is, uh, if, if, if you're interested in participating in the envelope challenge, you might want to consider starting off with this technology, looking at how far we've taken it, and seeing if you can help us come up with some solutions that would help us satisfy the feedback that we've gotten from uh, contractors and installers of, of, of siting installation products. Everybody thinks that you know, the idea of having a very high R value product is very saleable, uh, especially in very old homes that have very poor uh, insulation in place. Paybacks are less than 10 years in some of those things. But the issue of application is, is difficult and, and trying to, uh, several of the contractors have dumb it down as much as you can, make it as easy as possible to install, uh, using as few tools as possible to install, uh, would, would significantly improve likelihood that this product would make a splash in the marketplace. So that's the end of my, my presentation. Uh, I don't know if, we're, if we take questions or not, but uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you all have uh, on the technology or some of the feedback that, that we receive. Uh, go share with me your ideas. Those are, those are golden. Save those for, for the competition, but uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you all have. So we have one question here so that came on the chat. The question is, what ideas do you have to prevent the release of silica dust, which can cause black lung, from being released into the air and scattered around? Want me to give you the, the solution? <laughs> well, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of thoughts that we, we, we bounced around. Uh, the first thought is the, the vacuum panels can be made any width. So, uh, in the, in the test that we, we had in the laboratory, the, the panels were roughly two feet square. So you could actually cut these on two foot increments and not release any silica. We can make the, the panel size any size. We can make it, uh, unfortunately, the cost goes up. Uh, if we increase the number of panels that we install, the cost per square foot goes up. So we need to come up with a kind of a good common middle ground between uh, how many how many panels we include and, and what the overall cost is. Another thought is uh, to uh, have these panels such that they can be popped off. So when you come up to uh, an architectural detail like a window, instead of cutting them, you just pop them off and replace the insulation with a piece of foam insulation. Another idea is to install the insulation first and put the vinyl siding afterwards. And again, when you get an architectural detail, you don't use vacuum panels, uh, a more traditional insulation, put that in place. Uh, so those are a couple of ideas that we have. Uh, some of them you know, take us away from our earlier ideas of multifunctional applications, uh, again, separating out the insulation layer and the cladding layer. The nice thing about that is now we're not married to just one type of cladding. If we separated them out, we would then be able to apply the insulation under any cladding system, but we wouldn't be able to do it in, in as effective uh, a space as, as we can with the vinyl. 
the vinyl is a is a good surrogate because it's it's hollow presently, and if we could just simply fill the back of the of the hollow vinyl with insulation, uh, and add maybe about an extra quarter of an inch, uh, it's uh, it's going to give us these fairly high R values with no uh, change in the overall application. So there's a couple of ideas. I'm not sure I have the right idea, but uh, I'm hoping that you all have uh, better ones than I do. Thanks, Andre. This is Kim Trenbath from NREL again. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box, um, the webinar chat box. And I will give a couple more minutes or one more minute um, to see if anybody else has any questions. Um, while we're waiting, if you want to have a, if you want to ask a question on the line, feel free to let us know through the chat box and we can unmute you. While I'm giving it a little bit more time to see if there's any other um, questions that come through, um, I want to remind you that this is the last of the webinar series, so thank you for joining us. Um, also, our challenges are currently open right now. Um, in order to be eligible, you have to be enrolled in a U.S. college or university. And the challenges will be closing on November 15th. The website, again, to um, learn more is jump.ideascale.com. And to get to the JUMP website, from that site, the, the idea well, the idea uh, website is the site on which you will be submitting your idea. Um, but you can learn more about the Jump program um, if you navigate back to the Jump into STEM webpage. So there is a link from the Idea Scale webpage to get to the Jump homepage that's hosted by ORNL. Um, at this time, I don't see any more questions. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Thanks for joining us during the series, and um, have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everyone.